Thanks uh, for having me here. I'm really glad to be in Germany again. As I was telling David, I did study in Karlsruhe 20 years ago. Uh, but don't mind me, I forgot my German, unfortunately, so that's going to be English. Uh, so yeah, a bit about myself before I dive in. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's been 10 years I've been working in the music tech space. Uh, so originally, I'm a computer science engineer, so I started my career in tech at Microsoft. But uh, pretty early on, uh, my passion for music caught up and I had the opportunity to join Deezer, uh, the French streaming service. And since I was sort of the nerd and geek, uh, they assigned me the task of uh, working on discovery and designing, uh, obviously with a team, the recommender systems. So uh, back in the day, so you can see that's 10 years ago, I would launch features like Flow, the interactive radio, uh, playlist recommendations, uh, search engines, and how you would personalize overall the streaming service experience. And I, I learned a lot from there. Uh, later on, I would join Soundcharts, uh, that's a bit more technical. That's a business company in the music industry. Uh, they are a competitor to Chartmetric and they are an analytics solution that so they would provide you all the data you need to know about an artist. So they would track uh, radio, streaming streams on streaming services, uh, social media, following and engagement. And my task there was to design the dashboard. So how do I make that data understandable for a music manager, for a label manager, for a digital manager? And that's how I came to learn about a lot uh, about how professional act project, uh, sorry, professionals, how, how do they work and what do they need from data? And, uh, and more recently, um, working on that, I discovered that uh, providing data is not enough. You have to actually provide a guide on how to use it. Otherwise, you simply get lost and drowned uh, in so many insights that you don't know what to do with it. So there was that mission. I launched Music Tomorrow, my own company in uh, data consultancy. So we work with um, music companies, so labels, distributors, uh, CMOs to help them find a better way to work with data. And lately, since I, since I have that whole uh, streaming service experience, uh, we are launching our own tools that I'm going to talk a bit about, uh, focused on how do we help uh, artists and labels make, make the artists more visible on streaming recommenders. So more on that later. Uh, so today I'm going to give you a few insights of how, of how music professionals uh, do with data and uh, various use cases of AI in the industry, and then I'm, I'm going to dive in on recommender systems. Uh, so that's ambitious, so I'm going to try to be fast, <laughs> but you'll have a bit of space for Q&A later. Uh, so first of all, I'm talking about data, and I'm talking about it a lot, but that's also because data is very pervasive now in all the jobs, uh, all the music industry jobs. Uh, so every year at Music Tomorrow, we run a survey across movie, music professionals to track uh, the, the data practices. Uh, so we have a sample of more than 90 companies covering about 30,000 plus professionals across the industry worldwide. And this year, about almost, you can see that two thirds of them are using data every day. Uh, and that's up from half of them the year before. So things are moving pretty quickly. And that's, uh, and I'm going to give you a few examples of what would they do with it so that it's a bit more concrete for you. Uh, and that's very simple stuff that already you guys, if you already have uh, Spotify for Artist accounts, can already do. Uh, so uh, first of all, like I said, you can easily get lost. So the first thing you would do is uh, set goals. What do you want to look for? And an example is that, for example, uh, on Spotify for Artists, you would look at uh, the how are your streams distributed. Um, so what you want ultimately as an artist to have a sustainable career, you want to have your own fans and people following your artistic projects. So if you look at where does your stream come from, you definitely want them to come from users and their own playlists and their own libraries so that they think about you and they remember you and they know how to track you down whenever you want to listen to your track again. So you would pay attention to the second column from the left here, so listeners, listeners' homes playlist. 
and there are no rules or no good and bad number because it's it depends on your context but definitely you want uh the streams you get from promotional exposure so yeah let's say you get into an editorial playlist or a large official playlist you want people to go from there where they discover you to uh, their own playlist so you would see how you would look at streams how do they translate to that uh, same for algorithmic playlists so you would depending on where you stand for example that's a very good profile so you more than half comes from user playlists so one goal I would define for them is actually get more exposure because you can grow from there. Uh, let's say that share goes down to 20%, that then you have a conversion issue and you will want to work on how, what, why do, do people, uh, what don't, why don't they save more your music? So that's an example. Second example also related to this one, uh, recently they shipped out a new feature called Active Audience, uh, same here. You definitely want the left number up. Uh, so here, three percent is um, so the average. Uh, for example, eight percent would be a very good number. Uh, three percent is pretty low, and you want to aim for something in the middle. Uh, and what does that tell us? For example, um, one common mistake I see uh, with people using their data is sometimes they would think that people are like uh, just like we are in this room. Uh, so you would think that all streaming users are very passionate about music and they are diggers and they want to learn more. But the reality is that uh, about, I mean, depending on the service, uh, about 70% of streaming users are actually very casual listeners. So they would simply hit a mood or genre playlist and go. And they are not necessarily into, uh, at that moment at least, not necessarily into discovering new music. So don't worry if you don't have super li super listeners up to 20% because no one has that because the vast share of listeners are very casual. Uh, but still, you want that number, the higher the, higher the possible. Uh, and last example, uh, it's more a scouting example. So in labels, you have A&R departments uh, that are in charge of scouting finding new artists to sign and that are also in charge of guiding them in their artistic journeys. And prior to signing an artist, they would also obviously have uh, a listen to the music and they have to obviously engage with it. But they would also check data to see how they will work, this artist. So they would look at data, the one that I showed. So they would look at how engaged the audience is and they would also look for consistency. So that's an, that's an example um, of an artist that have very good signal, that some, somebody who will get obviously very good offers from labels um, because uh, what you see there is very consistent growth across different uh, platforms. And that's what you want because that's a sign of people actually engaging you with you as an artist, regardless of where you distribute your music. So you would see similar shapes on YouTube, on Spotify, on Deezer, on Instagram. And uh, that's what you want. And on the opposite, what you don't want is to have, let's say, growth on Instagram, uh, converting to no streams or not much on Spotify. Or at least that's an area that you will want to work on because you want consistency. And obviously, you don't want to rely too much on one platform. Um, so these examples are actually pretty simple. That's something that you can all access. And that's, uh, that's not that complicated. So that's what most professional also would do. They would look at uh, KPIs like that, I mean, metrics like that. Uh, so when I say two thirds of them are looking at analytics every day, that's what they do. I mean, they would go to first, what we call first party analytics. So the platforms analytics, so YouTube studio, Spotify for artists, Apple music for artists and so on. They would go to these tools and look at what's happening. And then uh, half of them would get a bit more sophisticated and would go to third party analytics. And, uh, what they do with them, so I was mentioning sound charts and chart metric, and those platforms track over 2 million artists every day to, to look at KPIs like the one I just showed. And what they do with them, obviously, is looking at their own artists to see what's happening in the, across all platforms, but they would also use them for benchmarks. And that's how I would advise uh, you guys to use them as well, is to not, not only look at what's happening to you, 
as an artist, but also look at what's happening to other artists, other artists that have aspiring careers that you want to have as well, to see who are the influencers that are prescribing them, uh, what does their growth look like? And then you can sort of set your expectations of things that you could also achieve yourself. Um, and last one, um, more and more, because uh, when I started Music Tomorrow, so not that long ago, that was only three years ago, the most common analytics tool that a uh, label would use was spreadsheets. So the, the, the bar was pretty low. <laughs> and that was a good indicator that we had, uh, <laughs> well, that we were on the right track to work with them. And um, I'm happy to see that, uh, I mean, obviously not, th not only thanks to us, but that um, labels are getting a lot more mature now every year uh, working with data. So I was happy to see that this year, spreadsheets were only coming second in the top tool that they would use and that their own data solutions uh, were now their top uh, priority to develop. And still, no, no rocket science there, but they would simply use um, business intelligence tools like Tableau, Looker Studio, I mean, I don't want to lose you here, but uh, they would use these uh, to cross-reference their own data with third-party data to be smarter and to have more specially, specialized analytics uh, tailored to their, own, to their own issues and problematics. And, um, and that's the trend that that's going to keep uh, that's gonna keep growing and they are going to get a lot more sophisticated. Uh, along those years and um, and the survey, 70% are planning to increase that budget of working with data and a third of them significantly. Uh, so I talked about that already. And significantly means that uh, they can move from spreadsheets to better BI to uh, let's say even more advanced stuff like with AI. And the state of AI, so in our sample, uh, working with AI, the top companies that are leveraging AI the most is, to no surprise, um, distributors and uh, music tech startups. That's And why do you think distributors, why would that be? So distributors, so they are the, believe, the tune core, the CD babies, the distro kids of the world. And they have, they're basically sitting on the largest data sets because they are distributing millions of artists uh, to streaming platforms and they know what's happening. So they get what we call private data. So they know everything uh, from streams, from saves to skip rates, uh, to where you were playlisted and things like that. And that's basically a gold mine when you want to analyze artists. So they have they're among the ones who have the most advanced data practices with it. And I'm going to deep dive on uh, what do they do. And, uh, and then uh, if you want to work with AI, at least until very recently, you needed very large data sets. So to work with AI, you have uh, to train what we call training data. And training data uh, was extensive. So you need lots of data to train. So unfortunately, that leaves the... Um, uh, small players aside because they will, let's say you have an indie label with um, 30 artists on your roster, then you don't have enough data to run this type of analysis at scale. And, um, and that's why we see emerging an ecosystem of music tech startups that are trying to solve that problem and level the ground uh, between small players and very large players. Uh, so what do they do? Uh, with such a large amounts of data. So they would, um, most of them at least, uh, when you're working with a catalog, let's say you are a publisher or a label or major and you have a very large catalog to work with, then the first thing you would, the first issue you would need to tackle is a clustering and con content classification. So what music do, you ha do I have in my catalog? And that would be a signal analysis. So what genre is that song? And you can think uh, that's easy to do. And if you have the song in your catalog, you should know what it is. Uh, but at scale, you, 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 you definitely need a tool to help you browse the, the breadth of data that you have. Uh, second, you have predictive models. And that's, um, that's actually very um, important for all things royalties. Because uh, assuming you're an artist, you've invested in your song production and promotion and just distributed and you get 
uh, large amount of streams, hopefully, uh, then you need to get paid for that. And, uh, but unfortunately, the value chains of music, like for the time to collect uh, your data and then convert that into money that you can actually put in your pocket, usually months go by. And predictive models uh, can help actually shorten that time because if we are able to predict that uh, from your million of streams, you will get that amount of money, then we can enable you in advance. So lots of distributors and CMOs are working on this. Um, then recommend their systems everywhere on streaming and digital platforms. So I'm, I'm going to expand on that later. And um, and this year, you cannot ignore the spike of uh, Gen AI uh, generative algorithms. And not only, I mean, it's obvious that it has a large impact on the way you create music. And uh, I think media have covered that a lot. But uh, Gen AI are also investigating and already um, in use in some companies for many or other areas of the music business. So think of it as a way, for example, that would automate your artist pitch. So you have PR people, um, uh, trade marketing people who are working with um, platforms to pitch artists to get into playlists, to get, to get into media placements. And you spend large amount of time uh, crafting a pitch to sell your artist and Gen AI can actually help them a lot and many companies are looking at how do I automate the thousands of pitches I'm doing every week. Uh, so think of it not only in music, but in general, in the business, how can text and text and image or generation can help and uh, smart people think about that. Uh, and last but not least, so I'd say I would focus on that. Uh, so talking about unboxing, um, so AI uh, is basically coming everywhere in all sides of the business and it's critical that you have at least a general understanding on how these things work so that you can better uh, anticipate what's coming and better organize yourself uh, to develop your career. And um, in that sense, the UK government has published a study where they showed that 90% uh, yeah, 90% of creators express the desire to understand better uh, how recommender systems work. And that's not because they're interested in data. I mean, th that's not necessarily because they are curious about data science. That's because they understand that these algorithms can make or break a career. They understand that on streaming platforms now you have from 30 to 90% of content listened to that actually intermediated by those systems. So if they ignore you, basically you don't have leverage and you can't be discovered. Uh, so a bit of reminder, um, a hand, uh, maybe raise your hand if you're already aware of how these systems work. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Good news, I have something to, to tell you and to teach you. Uh, so those systems are actually not that uh, difficult to understand. Uh, they're all like, whether you're talking Apple, Deezer, Spotify, YouTube, they're all based on the same principles. So I'm trying to make it easy because we don't have much time. But the first one is basically looking at what people do. So if in this room, we are all listening to two artists jointly together, then they would be considered similar and they would be recommended together as well as simple as that. That's the same way it's happening on Netflix or any other uh, any other platform. Second principle, uh, because that's one way of doing things, the other way of doing it is simply, let's say you listen to a lot of trip hop, then I'm gonna recommend more trip hop to you. And what platforms do is that they use a blend of, do of both. Uh, so they look at artists jointly listen to together, and they look at a bit of the, ge uh, the musical genres or other uh, characteristics of the music to recommend them. That works better because if you do one without the other, you can end up uh, with a, what we call filter bubbles and you never go out of it. Or you you go um, all the way to songs that may not have more much sense together. And uh, and lately, those systems are getting more and more sophisticated and they take your context, where you listen to, what you're doing, in that particular listening session, uh, they're getting a lot more uh, sophisticated in that regard. Uh, so what we do uh, at my company is that I know, uh, basically I know from a long time how these things work and I had that task in the back of my he 
head thinking how can I use that knowledge to help label break the artist. And that's how I came up with the idea that the same way you can do SEO, so uh, search engine optimization on Google, so basically you can have a set of techniques to rank your website up on Google, you can actually apply the same concepts uh, to streaming recommenders because those rec because the Google search engine is actually a recommender system and not much of a search engine anymore. So basically the same stuff you can do to Google, you can do to Spotify as well. And that's the gist of it. So basically we came up with uh, first a way of thinking and approaching things. Um, so uh, the same way you would like, let's say, improve the JavaScript of your website uh, to have a better ranking, here you can do the same. So you can make sure that all the technical information that you provide to streaming platforms is uh, is good and accurate and makes sense with how you want to position your audit. Same thing, same thing for pitching. Um, second, you can think about um, how, because it's very common, and actually Spotify just really did a whole press release yesterday about that. It's very common to, for artists to work jointly with other ones, uh, whether that's a collab, that's a featuring, that's a remix. Uh, the, the, there's no barriers anymore. And you can actually anticipate how this collaboration are going to impact your algorithmic profile. And uh, basically, you can use that to set expectations. So I'm mean, like, we are in no place to tell you what to do artistically, but still, you can set expectations because we had, like, I had the the case of a um, large label marketing manager coming to me and say, we had that large hip hop artist who did a collaboration with that emerging TikTok uh, singer. And we didn't get as many release radar playlists as expected. We didn't get as many ex as much exposure, although although we expected uh, sort of to benefit from one another ex audiences. And looking at how a recommender would classify both artists, I could explain to them that's why you didn't get that much because basically they had no common ground, whether uh, sonically across genre or. Uh, in terms of audience and patterns and actually algorithms of patterns to analyze and there there was none so that that would explain so basically it's uh, setting expectations so if you do that uh, you can expect uh, external media because they are but you cannot expect uh, that much boost in uh, in terms of algorithmic influence and last but not least uh, like i said algorithm love patterns so you you would simply direct positive reward um, so you would direct your marketing efforts to audiences that would respond well uh, to your content. So think about looking at who has debates, uh, who saves your songs in their playlists, who uh, has them on repeat listen, and those are the people that you want to promote your music to first because they would train the algorithm, uh, the algorithm about who's the right audience for you. Uh, so simple as that, uh, you would have, so we have, so I, I showed you the whole way of thinking and methodology. And uh, we have tools to sort of automate uh, that line of thinking. So we have obviously in health check, like are you checking all the boxes, at least to be eligible, to be recommended. Uh, so that's one. And the things to be eligible is how do you have your lyrics uh, filled? Are you using the artist picks? Are you using the platform features? Stuff like that. And then uh, we have another tool that's gotten slightly more sophisticated because we basically reverse engineer the way uh, recommend the system work. So we have our own algorithms on, on top of uh, Spotify's and our algorithms basically uncover how you have been perceived uh, by the platform. So that tells you uh, when I was talking about uh, listenership similarity, so with whom you've been listened to, that's what we look at. And so we can tell you uh, very basically for one artist that we look at, we look at all the artists that are popping up in recommendations with them. So that tells us, okay, you are frequently listened to with that artist. And there, uh, that can give us insights about who are your listeners and have you have you been accurately classified? Because then that will impact um, how you will market or maybe if that's wrong and if you've been wrongly classified, then you can do something about it. So that's an example uh, we did. We did run this um, analysis on Joji. That's a very famous hip hop 
uh, singer who actually got famous from doing like uh, initially he's not he was not in music he was simply a YouTube influencer doing very silly stuff uh, there <laughs> don't check it out and um, and looking at the artist and what was happening on Spotify when he finally like got to be more at ease with himself and doing less silly stuff and more music. Uh, then we looked at his map and we would see like um, at the bottom right that he would be listened to with very uh, other viral rap artists because that's where he came from. So, so we have that whole YouTube ecosystem also uh, that we could see on Spotify. So every, every so-called is an artist and every rectangle is a playlist that would influence the forming of that group of artists. So basically we look at all the artists that were connecting with him within algorithms. Uh, and all the other clusters, the top one is the mellow hip hop that is consistent with the music he's actually producing. And on the top left, uh, you have another group of artists that's 88 Rising, so that's his management company. I mean, not his, but the managing company he's working with. Uh, you can see, so you can see that algorithms are not only, that's what I was telling you, it's not only working, uh, um, analyzing genres. That's only one angle you can look at it, but you can look at it as, uh, with who am I listen to? And you can see that here that maybe it's influenced by your label, your management company, maybe that's influenced by how you were actually discovered. And once you actually understand that, you can simply say, okay, that rap, viral rap thing, I want to lean in more or at least, or maybe that's something I want to forget. And then I'm going to never going to market to them anymore. Then that's your choice then as a label or manager. Um, so yeah, that I want to um, leave a bit of a space for questions. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Yuli, uh, Future Music Camp has always been a lot about music data and on smart ways, uh, how to using them. Um, so yeah, we're very grateful to have you here and have your insight. Uh, yeah. Merci. Um, are there some questions? Oh, we, you're all there. I, I already have the mic, thanks. Yeah. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, a simple question. Uh, you mentioned that you should look at other artists' data and statistics. How can we do that if you're just like an uh, individual artist? Uh, so yeah, benchmark, uh, to me, benchmark is very important. Uh, so the ideal case is uh, definitely uh, try to uh, get your hands on a on charts or chart metric subscription. So whether from, from any entity that's able to help you, that's uh, the, the easiest way to get the data. So let's say you don't have uh, access to that. Uh, I would simply look at uh, their profile pages because um, today, for example, Spotify or YouTube would give away a lot of information about them. So for example, on Spotify, you would have the discover down section and that's on the profile page. So you go to the profile page and this discover down section tells you where have they been discovered and through which playlists. And these playlists can either give away media that have promoted them. So you have a lot of festival playlists, media playlists, radio playlists. Uh, so you can see that probably. Uh, you can also see maybe moods. Uh, so for example, uh, if your sonic genre tells a lot, I mean, fits a particular mood uh, or type of mood playlist, that's where you would see it and maybe think about positioning uh, through that. So yeah, I would at least look at that and look at also their own similar artists if you don't get access to fancy, fancy tools like ours or Chatmetric or Soundcharts. Cool, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Awesome. Yes, yeah, super. Thanks for the insights. I have a nasty one. So if you give back this feedback to the artists, the label, the management, um, don't you see a little bit of a danger of kind of mainstream filter bubble brain washing to say, come on, I, I tweak a little bit my lyrics. I tweak a little bit my metadata. I think about my collabs. So I actively change my musical content 
in order to be yeah in a better situation for the recommender algorithms which we already have on spotify with these things like get it in the first 15 seconds think about the break etc thanks um Actually, I, you're absolutely right, and I would be, uh, uh, let's say, um, a negative side effects of approaching things. Um, but no, uh, actually, the way we work with labels, we actually don't have these discussions, uh, or not exactly this way, because uh, usually the um, uh, the dice are already rolled, so the music is already there, and the question is more, and especially. I would say uh, I'm not too worried about that, especially given the current concern of mu the music industry with catalogs. So the way uh, I think you're familiar with the way that consumption has, is progressively is shifting from new releases to catalog songs. So labels, their main concern, at least one of their main concern is how do I make the best of the songs that are already there? So this way you are not influencing really uh, production or lyrics or so uh, you're more influencing consumption. So it's more about the way that you look at it is really a mostly first and foremost as an audience insights tool. Uh, because most of them are really in the dark when it comes to to whom should I promote my song. And that's gives that's giving them insights. And for sure you can like turn dark on it and <laughs> and influence it. But um but uh, I don't. It's not that easy, and it's more like making the best of what's happening. Haben wir weitere Fragen? Are there any more questions? Here in the front. You mentioned uh, artist pitches, and, and you said you can automate them to send out thousands. Uh, uh, also, is on. Uh, you mentioned artist pitches, pitches, and uh, you said you can automate them to send out thousands of pitches. You mean to labels, or uh, what do you mean by? Uh, yeah. So, let's say you are a distributor and you have a roster of five hundred thousand artists, mm -hmm. and you are distributing to uh, streaming platforms. And the way, uh, for example, today, if you want to get into an editorial playlist, an official playlist on Spotify, you need to pitch the editorial team on Spotify. And uh, distributors, the top ones, they all have channels where they can submit pitching to sp the Spotify editorial team. And uh, some of them, for example, the largest distributors, they, they are pitching thousands of songs uh, every week. And they are automating it. You, you were not talking about uh, single artists. Or, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you talk about the distributors. Okay. Yeah, they are, and yeah, distributors. I think ah, about that. But as an individual artist, let's say, I'm in the future. So let's say, three. I, I don't know how fast, but let's say a couple of years from now, uh, you you will actually learn from those best practices on how to pitch your artist individually, because if a distributor is able to submit thousands of pitches every week and to see uh, the reward of uh, getting in or not getting in, then you definitely learn from, uh, and automatically, I mean, that's, that's one way I would do it. I would learn from what's working, what's not working. And then I would sort of share that knowledge of best practices to the individuals but that if, are doing that. If the uh, editorial team of Spotify becomes, uh, gets uh, millions of uh, the pitches uh, every day, what do they do? They can't do anything, right? Uh, they already get them. They already get that, them. What, that's what the thing. They, what, so that's only making to? the lives of uh, music industry people easier because they get, uh, they get the pitches. Yeah. Uh, for them, I think that's an upside because they get more quality pitches. So instead of... Um, so instead of, I mean, they're already get, getting thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of pitches every day. So part of it is already automated. So they already automate the classification of the songs. They already automate a lot of things. They already automate on which uh, uh, desk does your pitch lend to. So they already automate that. Uh, so that's only sort of balancing the power. So if you submit a better pitch, even automatically, then you have a better chance of landing on the right table. Thanks. Um, is this working? Yeah. I, um, I want to reinforce a little bit the point of, um, I think Stefan Baumann was it? Um, so the, we had yesterday, we had this example of um, AI bots listening to AI bots. And 
I think this is a very probable situation that um, the more pitches come with ChatGPT or the further AI algorithms, um, the more the poor Spotify teams will um, release on uh, on AI bots sorting out all the pitches. So in the end, maybe you have, yeah, you have an uh, AI optimized music that AI listens to. It's not an offense. It's just a, you know, a, a, like what 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 will happen but if everything is automated and the and the the um, the information is getting more and more and we just we just people. Yeah, and uh, that, uh, unfortunately, that's the reality today already. So today, people are already drowned in content. So there's no way, even an ENR, even a scouting person, they get thousands of artists. I mean, whether if you want to get signed to a label, they already have to filter through the noise, and they already have thousands of um, artist pitches to to sort that out. So. The technology to to filter and to find the right person is definitely going to be there, whether ChatGPT is involved or not. And I, I would say even that ChatGPT is not the most uh, heavy component of it. Like the, the filtering across data on artists is a lot more important. So you have actually the pitching part of it is more, how do you tell the story? But then that story has to be consistent with the data as well. Um, so it's a blend of many things that are automated anyway, and the streaming platforms with the rise of Gen AI music swarming to their platforms, that's getting like uh, the, the number that was floated yesterday was uh, uh, 1,200,000 ,000 songs every day. So for sure it's automated. So the question is, is more about um, how do you make it this, uh, how do you avoid uh, the bias? How do you make that? How do you make the AI that are going to sort those the most transparent, the most unbiased possible? Then trying to avoid them because they are going to be there anyway. I think we have time for one last short question. Okay, uh, I'll keep it short then. Uh, okay, last question. Um, uh, is because you were talking about uh, people being more casual listeners in general and uh, people like to listen to moods. I find myself also liking to listen to moods and stuff like uh, more than artists specifically. Uh, is that kind of, can you observe that that is maybe a tendency that as an artist you, you kind of have to, or you should rather focus on finding the right moods than having specific kind of uh, elements of your music in as a like, into yeah, more more focusing on moods than on like, a song and uh, specific elements like is that something you can observe yeah and uh, and uh, and with that there is one way to sort of go dark about it and let's say uh, i mean people are already doing that so some people are like um generating a lot of music per mood and uh, creating their own mood playlists boosting the playlists and trying to get that many streams on those playlists with that, uh, with no particular artists behind, but simply people who write a lot of the same mood stuff for those playlists. So that's already happening. And, um, but the thing is, um, you, let's say, I, I would strongly not advise that. So as an artist, you may uh, also be playlisted in the mood playlist that's driving a lot of streams. But the thing is, it's not really sustainable for a career. So I, I, I consider that you have several classes of artists. And, um, and if you want to actually be an artist in the sense of uh, getting fans, touring, creating an actual artistic career, that's not a good way to go because you would be very reliant on those playlists. And once you're out, you're out. So let's say you get into that jazzy fireplace because you had that very chill mellow jazz uh, song into it. The day you're out, you're out. And then where does that leave you? You, you don't have any organic fans that you can rely on. Um, so, and I actually, we had that very particular case of an experimental jazz artist who did a few jazzy fireplace songs and he got those playlists. And ultimately, that sort of killed his uh, other ex experimental jazz catalog because people coming from the mood stuff, eager to have more mood stuff, would sort of get disappointed with the 
more intense stuff. <laughs> so and what he did, that was um, not actually my idea, but he did create two profiles uh, on streaming platforms. So one for the mood stuff and one for the experimental stuff so that uh, people wouldn't be confused and so that his audience uh, who's curious to learn about his career and what he's actually doing on stage uh, would find that in his catalog and so that sort of algorithm would pollute <laughs> the audience with other um, audience from other sides of what he does. And that was his solution uh, and that worked for him. But yeah, uh, mood, mood playlists are very uh, quite tricky. All right, many thanks for your question as well. Um, yeah, we're running out of time. I'm sure there are many questions more. Uh, you can maybe uh, ask Julie uh, later during the breaks or during lunch. Big round of applause for Julie. Many Thank thanks. You.